Good morning, I'm Tripp, and this morning, YouTube finally admits that there was a hack of all those accounts that got compromised on their servers. They figured out at least some of it. Winmore has an exploit, and the Hacker News gets loses their website and gets deleted by Google. This is the Insecurity Brief podcast. It features tech news and analysis throughout the world. This podcast is made possible through advertising and listeners like you. If you can't donate, please share this program. We depend on you. People have been complaining about being hacked on YouTube for quite a while. On Google too. And uh, a story got written by Recorded Future on the 21st. Catlin Kemp, who is, uh, I guess, a staff writer for them, uh, put out this story that Google unmasked two-year-old phishing and malware campaign targeting YouTube users. You know, a lot of this stuff that keeps getting pushed by big media, I believe, is this double factor stuff, even the White House is pushing this agenda. And there's two reasons for this. One is, does it protect your account? No. I've talked about this in the last couple of weeks where SMS we know got hacked. Everybody in the, in the world's SMS got hacked. There's multitude of ways to uh, spoof SMS messaging. Um, and this is just one more. Let me read their story just a little bit and to give you a flavor of this. More than 4,000 YouTube accounts were hijacked in a two-year-old phishing campaign. YouTube creators were tricked with offers for business collaborations. Hijacked accounts were sold on underground marketplaces for from prices ranging from $20 to $10,000. Almost two years after a wave of complaints flooded Google's support forums about YouTube accounts getting hijacked even if users had two-factor authentication enabled, Google's security team finally tracked down the root cause of these attacks. In a report published today, the Google Threat Analysis Group tag attributed these incidents to a group of hackers recruited in a Russian-speaking forum. Tag said the hackers operated by reaching out to victims via email with various types of business opportunities. YouTubers were typically lured with a potential sponsorship deals. Victims were asked to install and test various applications and then publish a review. Apps typically used in these schemes involved antivirus software, VPN clients, music players, photo editors, PC optimizers, or online games. But unbeknownst to the targets, the hackers hid the malware inside the apps. Once the YouTube creators received and installed the demo app, the installer would drop malware on their device. The malware, which would extract login credentials from and authentication cookies from their browsers and send the stolen data to a remote server somewhere. Uh, the hackers would use the uh, authentication cookies to access YouTube accounts, bypassing the need for two-factor authentication token and move to change the password of the account's recovery email and phone numbers. The victims would be locked out of their accounts and the hackers would typically sell the hijacked YouTube channel on the underground marketplaces for stolen identities. Okay, this is the thing about all of this stuff and this is one of the reasons. I mean, you got to be vigilant on your account. But one of the things is the phone number thing is not secure. And the other side of it is if you go out and you look for your cell phone number right now, chances are that one of these 
2FA so-called companies protecting your account has already posted your phone number on the internet. So what do you do about this? Well, just like social media, I believe in having multiple phone numbers, multiple SMS accounts. Now you can get uh, an account from Google and that's not necessarily the one that I would recommend. Um, there are other services like Twilo that you can get a number from or you can get for relatively little money. I mean, there's one that's a hundred bucks a year that you can get from a company called Red Pocket Mobile and there are other providers that'll sell you, send you a SIM chip. Now, that SIM chip has a phone number associated with the SIM. Remember, so cell phone numbers are not typically associated with your phone or device. They're typically associated with the SIM card itself and the carrier that the SIM card exists on. So with that being said, you can get a SIM card, put it in your device, register it, and give that SIM number out to these providers and there are a number of apps that allow you and services that allow you like Twilo to take that number and put it into a virtual system. In other words, you can call forward your SMS messages to another device so that when you give your um, phone number to big data, you're not giving up your real phone number. And that's where I was headed with this. Um, I'm going to be talking about this a little bit more in a little while, but this stuff about hacked groups and being locked out of your account and this 2FA garbage has really got to go. PT Swarm's website, uh, there was a blog entry written by Saka, Sak, Sakowski on uh, October 20th, uh, titled WinWars Vulnerability Trialware When Free Software Isn't Free. He proclaims to be a web application security expert and in his this article really quick. I'm going to read in this article, we discuss a vulnerability in a trial version of WinRAR, which has significant consequences for the management of third-party software. This vulnerability allows an attacker to intercept and modify requests sent to the user of the application. This can be used to achieve remote code execution on a victim's machine. It has been assigned a CVE, um, but no CVE score. Um, WinWar is a application for managing archive files on Windows operating systems. It allows for the creation and unpacking of common archive formats such as RAR and ZIP, and it is distributed as trialware, allowing a user to experience the full features of the application for a set number of days, after which a user may continue to use the application or use the application, continue to use the application with some of the features disabled. Now, there are some considerations when you are allowing third-party applications on your corporate network. One of the tricks that I found in the past is setting up a network share and structure and redirect installing applications just like this to that network share. Now, it does impact the network speed. So if you're on a really slow corporate network, this idea doesn't work very well. But if you've got normalized speed to your servers, by installing all these applications on a shared network uh, space, you can actually set it so that the files themselves are read only and you can actually make it so that the users can't delete them or automatically update them. 
um, on their own. So you can actually control these third-party apps. There are ways to get to the app store or the application installed uh, list on Windows and on Mac for that matter um, by making calls in the background. And I've written stuff like that in the past. You know, these third-party apps, um, the users love them. They are necessary, but sometimes they're just more trouble than they're worth. I saw something on my Twitter account, and I have a apology to make. I've been talking a lot about bots on Twitter, and if you're in my Twitter community, you're well aware of that. I talk about bots a lot, but I also use bots. And because I use bots, I sometimes tweet out really weird things. Uh, what's going on is I have some accounts that I automatically retweet whatever they tweet. And last Friday morning, I found out that Hacker News got deleted from Google. They had no backup of their website, and their website was gone. I mean, it was deleted. They couldn't log in. It didn't exist. Google had completely deleted them from the Internet. Now, they did get their account back, and they did get back on the platform. In that process, I found out that they were using a service that I had never heard of before. Actually, I'd heard of it. I just didn't know what it was called Google Blogger, and it's a... It's a system that you can set up that is the equivalent of WordPress and runs off of Google servers. Um, now, this uh, development, although it was problematic for them, really opened my eyes and made me think a little bit more about decentralization of my own program. Uh, currently, I'm... Uh, uploading the video uh, to YouTube and uh, through the process of decentralization there are other opportunities including Rumble and another one which came around last week as well which is Truth Social that people were talking about on Twitter as part of the Federation. Now, if you're not familiar with the Federation and what I'm talking about, there are silos of information. Uh, you're probably watching this on YouTube. You may have an account on YouTube. I really don't know. Chances are you're not because I don't have that very many views, yet more people talk to me on Twitter about my program than uh, watched it, so I don't know what's up with that. At any rate, what I'm getting at is that the silos of information, like Facebook, you have to have an account before you can see anything. Twitter, on the opposite side, is completely public. I love it when people block each other because you can simply open up a web page and see anything on Twitter except for what's in the direct messages. And you know, literally see everything on the platform. So it's kind of opposite of Facebook in a way. And then Google with its blogger and its YouTube stuff and its other things. But there is another platform, series of platforms out there that are all part of a thing that's called the Federation. And what that is, is a social media platform that it is decentralized. In other words, you can create an account on one host or um, node on the system, and you can communicate with anybody else on the platform. That would be kind of like you sending a message, a uh, direct message from Facebook to a Twitter user on direct message or um, sending a reply on YouTube and 
the reply actually show up on Facebook or Twitter. That's kind of what the system operates at. I'm not that great on that system, but I'm thinking about going that way um, and immersing myself in it. I think that this is actually the way that things are going to go. I mean, the news gets driven by you, by Twitter and Facebook. Um, besides elderly people playing games, I really don't know what its use is. Um, I post my show over there and a few people look at it, but that's about it. And I haven't used it really in a couple of years. So the decentralization of our systems is where things are going. Now, if you hadn't heard on YouTube, Steven Crowder got thrown off. Now, he's got his own website, but, you know, his own website is actually on one of the big players. So maybe he's going to go bye bye. A while back, I switched my website so that my website wasn't on Google's hardware. Uh, I wanted to move it away uh, simply because I didn't want to be canceled like um, I'm that important to be canceled. Some of the people that are in my groups have been canceled over and over again from a number of platforms. So. I know that individuals, it doesn't matter who you are, you can be canceled by big tech and they aren't going to like you. And what's more, it's canceling you off of big tech is going to get tied to our bank accounts and be tied to our telephone numbers and services pretty soon. So instead of getting canceled from these guys, maybe it's wiser to just move on and let them be who they're going to be and I can be who I'm going to be. I'm going to upload this video to a couple places. One, I'm going to upload it to a video system that I can't remember on the Federation and Rumble uh, as my first video. So until next time, I'm Trip. Have a great afternoon or day or whenever you see this. Till next time.